picture you posted was is really pretty. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Mandy, that's your home, old hometown, right? Uh, it's where we lived for about three years before we moved to Shalini. I just texted you, Shalini, in case you forgot, since I practically forgot. So. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. But I did remember. Thank you. All right, uh, Mandy, we're recording and open to attendees, so you can go ahead and I'm going to hand the host to you. Sounds good. Thank you, Athena. Enjoy Thank your you. day. Thanks. Okay. Um, seeing a presence of a quorum, um, I'm calling this July 13th, 2023 meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council to order at um, 4.01 p.m. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. Um, we are also recording this meeting um, video and audio. Um, so right now I'm going to take a roll call attendance to make sure everyone can hear and be heard. Um, we're going to start with Shalini. I'm present. Thank you. Uh, Mandy is present. Uh, Pam. Present. Jennifer. Present. And Pat DeAngelis will not be joining us today. Um, so we have four of our five members here. Um, we um, do not have any public hearings today, and the only thing on the, well, actually, why don't we get rid of our minutes for now? Did minutes make it into the packet? I think they did. Um, yes. So these are the June 22nd um, minutes of June 22nd was the, I think that's our ZBA interview special meeting minutes. Um, we're going to just do that so that we can basically spend the rest of the time without worrying on um, residential rental. So Jennifer, question on the minutes. Uh, you're muted. Actually, Sorry, it was I get back on, yeah, I had to get back on the screen because I was looking at the minutes. Was June 22nd? Yeah, so the minutes I'm looking at on page three, I thought that was the last meeting. They have, oh, there's was. one. So on page three, one, two, three, the fourth paragraph down, um, I think I said something in response. You said, we were having a conversation about density and it says, uh, Haneke stated, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, she encouraged the committee members to make proposals to change the densities of specific zones if they wanted to do so. And I thought I had just made the statement then that um, the different zones were already zoned for different density. And the way I read the minutes, it sounded a little like, wouldn't it be a good idea to have zoning that had different densities? And that's. Yeah, no, I, I, I remember it like you do, Jennifer. Um, so I would just maybe add a sentence, um, you know, Taub how, said. How, how about Taub noted that different zones already are zoned for different densities. Perfect. That's, I think that sounds great. Any Thank other you. changes? I'm sorry, this was not the ZBA interviews because my mind is like not working right, right now. Um, these were last meetings, regular minutes. It, it confused me because the title says special meeting minutes when they weren't the special meeting. Right, it is confusing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it made me rethink. Um, so yeah, so you've, Pam. Next, the next paragraph um, leaves out the end of the sentence and it says Taub and Rooney suggested voting on the bylaw in its entirety, I think is the word we're looking for. Yep. Yep. Any other changes to these minutes? Seeing none, I will make the motion to adopt the June 22nd, 2023 meeting minutes as amended today. Is there a second? Uh, second. Jennifer seconds. Uh, any further discussion? 
Uh, seeing none, we're going to vote. I will start with the aye. Um, Pam? Aye. Jennifer? Aye. And Shalini? I'm saying. Just because I, not because I was not there, but I didn't actually look at, I haven't had a chance to look at the video yet. And read, so. That's fine. So that is, they, they are adopted three to zero with one abstention and one absent. Thank you for just getting that over with. I know we run over when I'm like, oh, we need to end the meeting, but let's do minutes. So I figured we'd start with them this time and we'll end our meeting on time. And um, we're going to go to action items now. The only thing on the agenda is residential rental bylaw. We're gonna start with the fee structure, then go to the regulations. We have the um, legal opinion for the regulations, and then we'll come back to the bylaw, which we reviewed the legal opinion last time. So the bylaw that's in the packet is amended with that with a clean copy so we can see what it looks like after we talked about it last time. So that's the last thing we're gonna review. Um, I hope to get through all three today. Um, with that, let me pull up a, a fee schedule that is in the packet. Um, give me a second as I'm going to be managing all sorts of things today. Um, so um, this is a new draft of a fee schedule. As you see, it has no fees in it. Um, one of the things we provisionally decided a, a number of meetings ago was that we would potentially not recommend actual fees to the council, that we would recommend a structure um, and recommend that the council send that structure to the finance committee to actually determine the fees because that they might be better situated and able to discuss the fees in general as it relates to the operating budget and, and other things. Um, so given that discussion, I did not put, I don't think I put in the packet the, um, the Excel spreadsheet because I think we were getting thrown by the numbers in there, but I went back to our discussions and saw um, sort of where we potentially were with fees versus inspection fees. And I think we had settled on that the initial inspection fee should not be included in the residential permit fee. So I've split them out in the yearly permit fee. The inspection fee would be separate from that. Um, I think was one of the things we might have been leaning towards. So that's how this one's set up, but obviously we can remove anything we need to um, and modify it. But I thought it would might help if we um, had a document in front of us that sort of talks about what we could do and everything we've looked at that has no numbers in it. Um, I'm happy to discuss any numbers we might take for section C, D, E, and F. They seem like the ones we could potentially do um, fees for and recommend fees for, because um, it was really the permit fees and inspection fees we were struggling with. Um, so um, with that, I noticed just in here that I didn't put, put the plus dollars per unit in the inspection fee side. So I wasn't fully putting in, a, a, I realize I missed that even though we discussed that. So let's start with any general comments or we can just go through the sections and see what we might be thinking. I know not all of these um, actually meld with each other. So we might have to get rid of some of these lines because um, they might not go together. Um, so um, I, I yeah, just wanted yeah. to note, I just wanted to note that I'm not able to get into um, the SharePoint site. It's it's blocking me and I don't really have the time or energy to try to un undo that right now. So if if we could if we could enlarge this as much as possible, I I yeah, that's that that thank you. Okay. I will keep that in mind. So I I have six options here. They might sort of all work together. Um, I think it depends on what we decide about options one and two in some sense, right? Because I think one and two actually conflict with each other. Um, um, potentially. Can you, explain, can you explain why what number two actually means? So number two, um, parcel with a maximum of four units. So on any parcel that has one, two, three, or four units, 
um, if the owner has lives in Amherst and owns no more than three parcels. So for example, this is where we had talked about what about a local owner? Um, and, and this is why I'm not sure it goes with number one, potentially, it might be an option to, you know, we might want to pick either one or two, but this would be a local owner that maybe, I think, Pam, you've talked about this before, where someone yeah. next to you or near you on Cottage Street owns the property across the street, and so is not an owner-occupied rental, but is close by, um, and, and so we have had questions as to why couldn't they have the owner occupied sort of price. And mm -hmm. so I think number two is trying to get at that. If your principal residence is in Amherst and you own less than three or lower, well, three or less parcels that require permits, um, since our parcels are by, our permits are by parcel and the unit, you'll still need three permits, but and, and if one of them six, that one would not fall under item number two. But if one of them happens to have one unit in it and the other and the other parcel has two units, say you own three parcels that are rentals and one has one unit, one has two units, one has five units. Two of them would fall under number two and the other one would fall under number four. Um, we're trying to, I think, find the this language. And, and these these are obviously negotiable numbers depending on if we want to go with it. Trying to find the sweet spot between People who are not are are maybe doing this to add a little bit of income in retirement or non-retirement, but it is not their main business as a full-on business. I would say, you know, so someone, um, you know, Caymans. I, I don't know whether Caymans actually owns property or just is the manager for properties, but. But Caymans, we wouldn't want to fall under number two because they are, that's their sole business and all is owning and managing properties and large numbers of properties. Um, and so I think we were going with sort of the small manager that just has one or two properties with this from the conversations I we've had on fees. Um, I don't know whether it's actually doable. That's one thing I like to know from Rob um, versus number one, where it's the owner occupied exemption. This one's more of like local owner exemption. Yeah, I think it's doable. Um, I think we can identify that a property owner, you know, where their principal residence is and, and apply a different fee to that. Um, I do wonder if there's an opportunity to, you know, gain that a little bit over time, but, um, you know, I, it's, it's doable. Rob, I'm sorry, I missed, I missed the word that you used. Do something doable. I said I, that it is, that it is doable as far as I setting think you up used the word game. Prior to that, I used the word game. Uh, you know, uh, with, you know, an owner of multiple properties that may not live in town, claiming that one unit is their principal residence, it, you know, just creates difficulty or, you know, work for us to try to sort through. Um, but I guess the result is we could do it if we needed to. One other question I have for Rob and John is of sort of options one and two regarding owner occupancy on residential fees, which one do you think is more logical or appropriate? And I'm still not sure I'm convinced there's an appropriateness for change different fees between owner occupied rental permits, um, rental permits for parcels that have an owner occupancy and rental permits for parcels that don't. But I'm I'm curious if there's over one or two, we've we've talked about how sometimes the owner occupied units require um, are more responsive, um, in in and sometimes you know not not all the time, but sometimes more responsive, and therefore maybe it's it's better to it, they could have a lower fee on the permit fee. Um, but I I guess I'm looking at to Rob and John on whether one or two makes sense. Um, 
if it's disconnected from the inspection fee and which one of them or both might you recommend or not? I'm looking at um, number one, Rob, for a parcel with a maximum of six units with at least one of the units occupied by an owner. I can't think of an example of that. Um, uh, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, it's Nancy. It's, it's Nancy and North Amherst on what used to be Old Montague Road. That little eyebrow. Can't remember her last name. Gittle or something. Nancy. Yeah, Gittleman. Nancy Gittleman. Um, Gittleman. Thank you. Uh, so, yes, yeah, that's that, six. That's up to up to six units. So okay. You know that we have a hundred and. I don't know, 10, 19 properties that fall into that category. We've been doing that for the past now second two years uh, yep. with the current renewal that's happening. I think that's worked pretty well. I think we've had some positive feedback to that. Um, I guess my thought would be not to take that away if we didn't have to yeah. um, and continue to offer that to that smaller number of owner-occupied properties. And I think the logic there is strong that um, there, there are certainly a few exceptions and John knows them, but owner occupied properties generally are um, maintained a little bit differently and it's a whole lot easier to get a presence on site when needed and a response. Um, so again, there's exceptions to that, but I think, you know, I think there's some good logic there to offer that owner occupied reduction and it's, it has yeah. worked pretty well. There's, there's uh, for sure fewer um, hours of mine invested in those properties. So, so we'd want to say for a parcel with up to six units. Make it clearer. <laughs> do you think rob that number one and number two work together or not it, I, if i had to make a suggestion i think we don't need number two i think you know property owner or, or investor with 12 units somewhere in town whether they live here or not is a pretty significant investment and you know can probably handle the fees that everyone else is paying. Um, can we make it work together? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess there's gonna be, you know, a property owner would qualify in two, but then also once again, and then qualify in one, you know, for the further reduction. So that, you know, I guess we can we could work through that, uh, but they would, you know, potentially fit into both categories and, and take the lowest fee. Jennifer. So should we, it sounds like for simplicity, we maybe just, not, um, you know, do away with number two? I'm gonna help, I'm just throwing it out there. I, I'd like to hear from Shalini and Pam. I think that would be my reasoning too, is more of a simplicity, non-confusion, clarity, ease of inspections department and, and permit um, person and all but Pam um, I'm I'm looking at why why it's specifying a maximum of four units um, that's owner occupied I think we have all of one of those in town I'm looking at the chart that Rob gave us um, if it was just um, where an owner has a principal residence in town and owns no more than three rental units that's mm. that that's simpler uh, i mean that's really what we're talking about and i'd and i'd actually be interested in hearing from the um uh, from the folks that are listening in because i think there are probably a couple folks that are listening in today that have some opinions on this so you're suggesting instead of a maximum of number of units on each parcel, you're suggesting a maximum number of rental 
units, no matter yeah. how the parcels are configured. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. So that could be an owner has one, uh, you're, you're, the person you refer to, I think on Cotter Street where they live across the street and they, maybe they only have one parcel, I don't know. Um, right. And it's got one unit on it. Um, or they could have three parcels, each with one unit on it, or they could have um, three parcels. They live in one of which is a duplex and then have two other parcels with one unit in it. And that would qualify the other two parcels. Um, I think I all, of, all, of those, all of those combinations might work. It happens to be that they live immediately adjacent to one parcel with three units. Yeah, or something like that. Yeah, at that example. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because we're really. I mean, I I would agree with John that if we're talking if we're talking twelve twelve rentals, um, the the extra fifty dollars or whatever we come up with is not the is not the hardship. And 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 it's and it's a different. I think it's a different ball of wax than than the hands on. Um, I, I'm calling it owner adjacency that, you know, that lends that um, observation and, and availability to John or whoever is inspecting. Shalini. Yeah, I would be in favor of simplifying it to the number of units, uh, but I'm also in favor of uh, this section because even without the age uh, adjacency because i've spoken to at least two people uh, residents who are not full-time landlords but they want to they have like one unit or two units and they like to rent it to families and so forth so even though right now we may not have a lot of those but we want to set the tone where it supports future people who have an extra unit or three units and who are living here to have that sort of a benefit. So I do like this. I'm trying to make it more clear here. <laughs> I don't know if I'm succeeding. Um, we, we need to be clear that for this one, they have to pay the fee for each parcel they're paying a fee for. Um, or a permit or something. Um, I imagine if they own three parcels, that might be different than the three units on one parcel. The three units on one parcel is one permit. The three different parcels with one unit each is three separate permits. Um, so I think it would be per permit and that might exempt them from say, if we go to this route then where we might add a per unit fee or something or, or finance might add a permit unit fee. Does that language for now look good? We're, we're not going to vote on this today. We're going to bring it back next week. So <laughs> we're going to be able to think on it. I, I didn't see any changes, so I'm not sure what we're agreeing to. <laughs> oh, no, on this one. I'm not seeing any change. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm looking at. Yeah, sorry. I'm... Number two, I, I tried to make it clearer. Got it. Yes. So three is in conflict with four, five, and six. Um, so we either pick, in some sense, we have to decide by our options one and two, the only places, and then do we want a flat fee per rental permit for every other parcel, um, no matter how many units? Um, or do we want to, in some sense, stagger the cost of the permit? Again, this does not include an inspection um, at this point. 
based on the number of rental dwelling units on the permit. I think this is one where we've been vacillating back and forth. Basically, we're trying to figure out what we want to send finance as a suggestion. I'm looking for my notes. I made a bunch of notes and I can't find them. So I'm <laughs> sorry. No, and, and this clause could be added to this if we wanted to. So we're looking at whether we're looking at item three or items four, five, and six. And if we're doing four, five, and six, where the splits are. Um, and for any of them, whether we're going to forward a document that includes the plus random amount right now per unit. I'm curious what Rob and John think, but I'll go to... Uh, <laughs> That was my question. Okay, yeah. Rob and John, what are your thoughts? If we don't include, if this is really just the permit fee, no inspections, what are your thoughts? My thoughts are not include the per, per unit fee in the permit fee and uh, we capture that in the inspection fees. Would you split the permit fees up by number of rental dwelling units or would you go with sort of the all other parcels? I would go with all other parcels. Committee thoughts? So Rob would go with only what's highlighted. So we're talking, now we're talking non-owner occupied and we're talking non-owner occupied, everything from one dwelling unit to up to over a hundred, 200. Yes but no inspection included. This is just to get the piece of paper that says you have a rental permit. Oh. I mean, my understanding from all our previous discussions is that it doesn't cost this town, the staff more for just the registration fee if the number of units increase, right? There's absolutely no additional, right? The additional is only when it comes down to inspections. Am I right? That, that's correct. I think that's what I've said. Um, you know, anytime this conversation has come up when the inspection is not part of the fee, the work that the town staff does to generate the permit and then, you know, year to year renew the permit is the same from, you know, for a one unit property to a hundred unit property. Uh, it's become very automated now uh, and really the, the number of units on the renewal or the initial issuance of a permit card, uh, there is no difference. You want to think on that, Shalini? Yeah, I'm thinking. Yeah. Jennifer and then Pam. So as we get this, so we would say like um, a permit is fifty dollars a permit for everybody per per parcel, whether so it's per building. So if you're um Puffton Village, you're doing it per building. No, it's just per for that. Okay, so everybody pays the same, and then there's going to be some sliding scale of um, inspection fees based on number of permits. Correct. Okay. That's the, based on number of inspections, units inspected. So like Puffton, we've written into the bylaw. I think this is what Rob's potentially recommending. Puffton, we've written into the bylaw. The large apartment complexes have to be on an inspection schedule where every unit is inspected every five years. 
Um, so they get 20 units a year or depending on, well, it depends on how Rob sets it up. They can have 20 units a year every year if they have 100 units um, or they, the town might say, we're gonna do all 100 units this year and then we won't see you for five years. And that would, each time that inspection happens, this number here under inspection fee would be the sort of gradation and changing. Okay. Pam. Yeah, I, want, I wanted to come back to Rob's comment about the work involved. Um, we have been asking for the ability to extract information. So basically creating a database rather than just a, a, a word form. And I'm, and I'm just wondering if um, the work by staff to confirm, I know we, we have listed things like the number of buildings, the number of bedrooms and, and bathrooms in each of the units. So there's a, there's a lot of information going into some of these forms. Question one, is our form gonna be able to capture information based on multiple units? And, and two, is that going to be a database so that we could actually get information based on that? And that might require a fair amount more work to confirm some of that stuff. Rob? I, I think I, I follow you here, um, but I, I believe that it's, that's a one-time setup that we would be dealing with, with whatever the result of this bylaw is. Uh, we will absolutely have to build out part of a program that doesn't exist right now for inspections related to rental permits for capturing information on buildings within parcels on rental permits. Right now, what we do is just um, ask a series of questions about the total number of things on a parcel. Uh, and that's it. And that's all reportable and uh, sortable, uh, but we do need to build that out. But it wouldn't be a, a, a year to year thing. It wouldn't be something that we do. The applicant would be inserting this information through the application process. We just need to develop the program uh, for whatever bylaw we ultimately end up with. Okay, so um, I'm just thinking out loud that because um, you're going to be you're going to be inspecting, you know, unit one, three, and let's say one, three, and five. You have to actually have information on units one, three, and five within a building. So you are going to have to be able to break that out. That's right. The program will have to be able to. Um, uh, record the inspection on the actual unit that we're talking about or looking at. Um, there's probably ways that, you know, we do this already in, in other areas when we, uh, you know, inspect dormitories or uh, uh, mostly the college properties that have multiple certificates within a building. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the building gets identified and then there's a kind of a subset of all the um, the spaces within the building that get information recorded to it. Uh, so yeah, again, I, you know, there's definitely going to be a cost and a time involved with setting up the program. Uh, you know, everything through, uh, you know, John and I have talked about how we handle violations and, and, and fines and court proceedings and all that. We don't have any of that. That's all done very manually right now. I'm going to I'm going to tangent for just a second. Do do we have a do we have a sense of cost for the the program the, the computer program that's going to enable us to document attributes like that attributes like number of bathrooms, number of beds, that kind of thing? Do we know what that will cost? We haven't done that yet. We've talked a little bit about it with IT, um, and I've talked to, talked about it a little bit with the town manager because, um, you know, where will the funds come from to do that? You know, there's the the kind of the the partnership, the strategic partnership funding that's related to this this kind of um, use that I think I would hope is going to be available. I would ask that some of that money could be available. We've talked generally about, um, you know 
when this bylaw gets implemented, we would use those funds to develop the program we need. Uh, and you know, we're also talking about how to how to transition from John to a new code enforcement officer. And um, so, you know, we're we're looking at you know what funding is available for all those things. So I don't have costs yet, but um, when I talked about things like this with IT that manages the program OpenGov for us. It's in the tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, you know, typically these things are costing ten to thirty thousand dollars for types of enhancements to that program. Uh, so I wouldn't be shocked to see that kind of a number. Right. Okay. Thank you. So, are we leaning towards Rob's recommendation, which is in yellow, and then moving on to inspection for what we would send off to finance? at least initially. Pam? Um, I think it would be better for everybody on the staff to keep it simpler, but, but part of me wants a, a nominal add-on per unit just because there's so much, you know, a Puffton village with 400 units is, is just, a lot more, even though it may be on one parcel. Um, I, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna die on a sword for this, but it just feels like it would make it a little more equitable. I just want to support what Pam just said. Just, it hasn't clicked in my head why, and of course I'm hearing from you, Robin, you're the one who's doing this work, so. Yeah know it but it still feels like i'm thinking from the perspective of the tenants like if it's hundred dollars 150 dollars divide by 600 units or 500 units the impact is nominal versus if it's a smaller home with four families you know the cost is the burden is so much more on the tenants so uh and then i'm looking at some other i think it's lynn massachusetts that has 25 and 15 registry it's the registration fee and not the inspection i believe it's 25 and then 15 per unit so i'm just curious like how other towns were able to justify a per unit charge and so maybe i, I want to take a week to again look at some other towns maybe jennifer um yeah and i also i think pam said this earlier um there may be some I'd be interested in what some of the public comment is when we get to that. Um, so I'm glad we're having public comment after this conversation. And like I said, we're not voting today. So <laughs> um, I, I wanted to say, you know, I I think I favor Rob's um, approach. Um, and, and what I keep thinking is, you know, I, I hear you, Shalini and Pam, about from the tenant point of view, it doesn't seem fair, right? But I think we, when we're thinking about that, we're compartmentalizing the permit fee away from the inspection fee. And if we do what, if we do this on the inspection fees and Puffton with its 400 units is getting 100 units inspected every year and the single family, one family rental or the duplex is getting inspected every five years. And so Puffton is paying whatever the fee is plus that extra unit times that by a hundred every year, that's going into their rent. The renter with a duplex is paying, oh, as well as the, the flat inspection fee, whereas the renter with the duplex is paying the flat inspection fee every year, but the flat permit fee every year, but an inspection fee once every five years. So that inspection fee is split over two people every five years. And so I think that's where we get that cost differential. And I know just the permit fee makes it seem, if you compartmentalize just the permit fee to me, yes, I agree with Shalini and Pam that it doesn't quite seem fair, but I think we have to think about the two together and what is Puffton actually paying yearly combined if we do this. And then in that sense, to me, it doesn't seem as unfair, even from the tenant side. Shalini and then Pam. 
Okay, so I think in my mind, it's it's coming together that we want to look at the whole system in a way that it's equitable. And so, and I think inspection is its own thing because that does involve, and it may actually be a single home that's more problematic and that might end up regular inspections too. So that thing, but when we're creating this system because we do have to pay inspectors, we have to have staff, we have to do all of this. So instead of thinking it literally as how much is the paperwork per form, if you're thinking of this more holistically as a whole system, and how do we create a system for rental registration that enhances the quality of life of all homes and makes our homes more affordable, just one of our goals, then if we're keeping all of these values and looking at it holistically, it does make sense to distribute the cost of it in a way that it meets some of our other goals. Did that make sense? In my mind, it makes sense. <laughs> Okay, I can think about that. Pam. Um, I was going to go back to your example of, of Puffton or my example of Puffton. And, you know, unit 4B is also only going to be inspected every five years. So Puffton, the organization, may be shelling out a fair amount of money because they have 400 units. To them, the inspection cost will be high. But again, it will be it will be distributed to individual units. And so 4B gets inspected at the same frequency that the single family does. So I think I think we just need to not look necessarily at the total dollar um, um, impact on a larger property. Good point. Next question, before we move on to inspection fees, which I'm hoping will be quick. Um, if we go with a plus a per unit fee, so if we would, if we go with something that adds the per unit on, do we want it split out, for example, um, split out by permits for 20 to two to 25, 26 to 29, having different base fees um and then it's sort of and then and then a per unit fee on top of the different base fees um and then do we want to have a maximum permit fee i would and, sorry. hold on i'm sorry one more question with that as i read this number 6 that has a draft in here of, again, everything in green is up for talking, right? Um, maximum per building and per parcel, essentially, complex is parcel, right? And so would we want a max per building or a, in addition to a max per complex parcel or just a max per parcel type thing? Thoughts on whether we'd essentially go with number three with or without this, or numbers four, five, and six. Like number three with the plus per unit or numbers four, five, and six, or some combination of four, five, and six. Jennifer. Well, if we're using the logic of what it costs the town, so if it costs the town a certain amount to inspect a unit, whether it's a do, you know, each unit- This isn't inspections. This is still- I'm sorry. Per, I'm sorry. <laughs> Pam. Did Jennifer actually want to say something different? I think Jennifer's talking about B. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. I'm talking um, about inspections, never mind. I was going to ask Rob and or John about the, the breakdown. And in my mind, there is the, there's, we've, we've talked about the owner occupancy and then everything else is non-owner occupant. And the, the breakdown Again, I want to sort of feel from them the complexity. Um, Non-owner occupied from one unit up to nine is the largest category of of units that that we deal with, and there are almost a thousand dwelling units that are in the one to nine range. And then from ten to ninety-nine, 
there are only 43 and over 100 units, there are only 12. And so it seems to me like that one, one to nine is a category in and of itself. And then anything from 10 over is essentially the big boys. You don't have to change it right now, but. Well, I, I just, it would look something like this. Yeah. Or greater, this, greater or than this 10. one would just turn yeah. into 10, actually. Yeah. And that one would be deleted. Yeah. This one would just go. So ignore this, or ignore number five. It would look like number four and six. Rob or John, thoughts on that? As a breakdown, if we stuck with breakdowns? Yeah, no, I think it makes sense. Um, do you, so we would start with one though? Uh, so it'd be a permit fee plus a unit fee for that one? Well, for one wouldn't have an extra permit fee. It would your, be your base rate, non-owner occupied base rate. And then um, if there are additional units, it would be a additional fee to them. I'd, I'd come up with the language. I, I don't think, I think a prior draft has the additional language, Rob, that would add the per unit only for the second plus unit. And another option is another option is perhaps to have non-owner occupied single families, which are according to the chart around 680 of them at least. Um, you know, maybe that's the cutoff point. And then two to nine is is sort of that subset of smaller complexes around town. Does that make sense? John and Rob. Sam, can you repeat that last part again, please? Yeah, I, I was saying another possible breakdown is, is single units, like non-owner occupied, single units, single families, and there are 680 of those at least. Um, if, you know, if we were to split this out a little bit more, instead of from one to nine, it might be single families. And then two to nine is that, is that next major category of um, yeah. another 300. Are you thinking that the base rate for a non-owner occupied, say single family home, that one. But I'm just gonna throw a number out there, it would be like 150, so they'd pay 150 a year. And the permit for two to nine might have a base rate of 125 plus 25 per dwelling unit. Or are you thinking the base rate for the two to nine, if we split it out, would still be 150? Like, do you want those base rates to be different? Um. Good question. Um, um, probably not. So that means we could include the one in here and just make sure that the per unit is over the first. Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Good way of thinking through that. So I'm going to make a note that, in some sense, we're deciding if do people if we go with the split. Are people in agreement that the split makes sense at nine to 10 versus what was originally here? I'm seeing nods of heads, people liking Pam's proposal. So I'm gonna delete this. And then, so if, and so I think the decision is, and, and let, me, let me, what we're still up in the air with is what's in yellow, or so number three or what would become number four and five but we would choose four and five over number three with what i deleted if we go with an add-on for a per parcel we would split that up between one and nine and ten plus it wouldn't just be the add-on the three unit triplex is treated the same as the hundred unit puffed in on the per unit add-on 
Is that what we're favoring? Jennifer. So I just want to be clear. Are we, so we're not gonna do it one to nine, 10 to 99 and a hundred plus. We're just gonna make it 10 plus. I think that was Pam's proposal. Yeah. And is that because the, I mean, are the, do the hundred plus units get way beyond that? Like, I'm just trying to think if somebody who has 11, how are they gonna feel about having the same rate as someone that has 300 or? Oh, sorry, this would be per unit above 10, not 99, sorry. So the 11 unit would pay the base fee plus whatever the number here is added on, the 100 unit one would pay the base fee plus this number times 100. OK, I see. They're paying, right. So they'd be paying yeah, the 90 pay more, I guess they're right. Yeah, paying okay. a lot more because of the a per unit. Right, yeah. OK. Thanks. Or, it, okay. and depending on where the maximums are set, it might not be times 100, but um, yeah. But people would prefer that this system numbers four and five over adding just a, a flat per unit for all other parcels, possibly changing these numbers in here. I think that makes sense. Such that we're deciding between three or four and five next time after we hear some feedback. Right? Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I would like to hear feedback on this. Um, and, I'm, and I'm not suggesting that the, that the additional fee per unit, especially having heard from Rob that it's not terribly helpful or, mm -hmm. or even necessary, um, you know, could be pretty modest. Yeah. Is there an advantage for breaking it up into these different levels as opposed to for all of the parcels, it would be, you know, the base fee plus per unit? Up so, to a certain amount. What we could do is, as I make notes here, if we're not sure which works better, we can send both options off to finance and say, we're not sure whether breaking it down makes sense or just one per unit fee makes sense. You know, depending on what they settle on, on what that per unit fee is, breaking it down may not make sense. We could send that to finance and say, with a say with a thing that says CRC favors, say, four and five, but we actually don't know, uh, Pam. So it's an option. Yeah, part of the part of the, the the thought process about ten and ten and over is that a condominium or a townhouse starts at ten units or max maxes out at ten units, and so that in my mind a condominium um, or a townhouse complex is you know a little different than an older house being renovated and has you know has multiple units or something in it. So um, I'm, I'm rethinking in terms of would there be a difference in fee perhaps between the, the two to nine? And, and I might not be averse to having just a, a, a less expensive or not as expensive as the, the fee for a, a big parcel, anything 10 and above. So I think we'll leave this with the comments. We'll think about it for a week. We'll come back. I'll create a new document so it's not marked up with some of the other things we've done if I can get it in the packet. Um, inspection fees. I've added everything I forgot to add. I think um, when I created the document on the per unit um, for reinspection, complaint, renewal, and inspection. Um, I think the question I have is with this, um, Beyond, I, I think it's appropriate to add a additional cost per unit because it adds time. We've heard from Rob and John, it adds time. Um, the question I have is, is there a reason we would separate out any of these because they require more base fee or less base fee? Like, So I guess my question to Rob and John are, Initial and renewal inspections, are they very so different that they might get a different base fee? Would they take different amounts of time? Or the reinspection fee, should it have a lower base fee because 
you're looking at specifically one thing, so it might take less time than say a renewal inspection fee. You know, um, so I guess that's where I'm looking for which of these might be able to com be combined into one line instead of four separate lines, or or does it make sense to have four separate lines with potentially different fees depending on the inspection, or should it just be an inspection fee no matter what kind of inspection it is? I, I liked the initial inspection fee as a category only because we were talking about trying to gather so much information about the property. And also um, it's going to be an opportunity to do a lot of the, the research of the history of the property, check old special permits and, you know, look for, you know, any conditions on the property. So that made sense to me and that would not occur in a renewal. Uh, that wouldn't be necessary. You know, that said, if it was just an inspection fee, we'd still do that. You know, we want to do that. It's really important to establish that that understanding of the property and, and accuracy in the records that we have. But I thought that having a higher initial fee did justify that. John, any thoughts? Yeah, I agree. It's uh, the first time through is going to be pretty time consuming because but what Rob's pointing out, you got to do quite a bit of research on the property and that's that takes some time. Once you have that gathered the next time through, you know, you're, you're just looking for um, health and safety violations at that point. Now, is there a difference between say a renewal inspection fee, a property you haven't been in in five years versus one where you were just there and you issued that notice of violation and now you're back to check that? is that is when you come back to check quicker such that maybe that would have a lower fee or are you still going through the entire checklist when you come back um, no i mean you shouldn't uh, well you know i just did a property this week and i've got probably 15 things that are you know need to be addressed when i go it, it took a little while to go through the property and look for those things, but when I go back there for a reinspection, I still got to look at all those things, to make sure they got addressed. Um, I'm I'm unlikely to be looking for additional things. There's another question I have: Should a reinspection fee, after a failed inspection fee, be included in the initial or, or in any of these other inspection fees? Should we be charging for a reinspection fee? I, I know there's some places that include that one one reinspection in the initial fee, so that they're not paying. You know, if you fail, you get you get you don't have to pay for the comeback to pass because um, it's already been included. Thoughts on that, Pam? Yeah, I think that's logical to have a fee for inspection and acknowledge that there's likely to be a follow-up um, on just maybe 90% of them probably. You have to you have to confirm that anything you you found has been taken care of. Um, I would say, can we call it follow-up inspection rather than reinspection? I think if we do all the language in the bylaws and all we can, yes. If we match the language, Robin, John, would it if we did this? Would it be just the first one, or would you want all of them included? Like, if you have to go back four times to get it fixed. At what well, point do you want to charge them for another inspection? <laughs> you better not. You better not be going back four times. That's no. They're missing the point then. So then you'd want to charge them for another inspection if you're going back four times. Oh, for sure. <laughs> so just the first one. Okay, I'll come up with wording. Does this then all look good for now? Um, I'm looking at your number three, sorry. 
Um, I don't think we actually need to have the plus a dollar, X dollar per unit. I think this is probably going to, a complaint is probably against a specific unit. I'm just guessing, I could be wrong. Let's go to John and Rob. <laughs> when you get complaints, are they generally specific units or entire parcels that have multiple units? Um, I would say the majority of them are folks complaining about the unit that they live in or you know what comes in this time of year, the, the thing that I'm working on this week, a uh, family delivered their daughter to the place that they've rented and you know, gasped. Um, so <laughs> that sort of thing. It, it seems like it would be quieter in the summer, but it's not because now we're going to come. We're going to we're going to drop. We're going to do our initial drop off here. Um, that's I bet that that's a single family home. Um, I it's hard for me to imagine that somebody dropping off at a complex it's still going to be a specific unit, isn't it, that they're complaining about? Um, the other complaint I have this week is that, you know, some exterior lights at a, at a um, apartment complex aren't working. So people can't, you know, um, find their way to the, um, to the public way. Um, okay. So for now, it sounds like we'll leave it like this. Think about it over the next week. I will get this out uh, tomorrow um, as an update to next week's packet. Next week's packet is already out there, but I will get it out to it, everyone tomorrow. I don't know when Athena will be able to post it online, but I will have it out to everyone else tomorrow. Um, we're gonna move on for now. Well, excuse oh, me, just sure. Just with, so um, I'm not sure we heard any feedback on C, uh, D, or E oh. from, from these folks. Um, is there a no-show fee? Is that is that something we do? Is that necessary? Um, a late fee? I I think I'm okay with a late fee as long as it's not us, the town, um, creating the the delay. Um, transfer of permit fees. I'm okay with that. And I don't know what administrative appeal is. That's that's if we shut somebody down and they appeal it. That's if we suspend the permit and they appeal it to the Board of License Commissioners. So from John and Rob, do those make sense? The only one I think isn't entirely necessary, if you want to simplify things, is the no-show fee. Um, or that could get incorporated into the reinspection fee as a kind of follow-up inspection item. If you wanted to make it simpler, we don't, I, uh, John, um, you know, you can comment on this. I don't think we charge for that situation. We, we never have charged for a no-show, um, but we absolutely would like to be able to deal with late registration uh, because that is something we struggle with. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I've only um, been stood up once and, um, you know, that just makes it harder going forward. I, I don't need to, to penalize you with a no-show fee. Okay, thank you. Good question, Pam. So we will move on from this um, to, let me get the next one open. Um, I'm gonna open KP Law's version and Pam, I will work with you to make sure you can, everyone can read it. Um, I might be slow in toggling back and forth because I have my own comments on this and I'm not opening the draft that has my comments. So <laughs> uh, I have to toggle on my own computer for this. So, um, and Mandy, I just want to make sure that we're talking the same version. I'm I'm looking at uh, 2023-0420 as the version. No, this is the version that went to KP Law. Um, so it is, it's in, it's, uh, I got to be able to move something. Okay. Um, it is titled Working Draft Revision 8, 
2023-0609 for regulations. And the, the title is revision eight. Apparently I did not change the revision in the, in the footer and header. <laughs> I don't always get that. Yeah, so it's actually, it's actually re revision 16. Is that correct? No, we're on the regulations. Sorry. Not thank the bylaw. You. Thank you. Okay. Regulations aren't as high as the bylaw in terms of revision numbers. <laughs> um, um, this one is this one actually has a KP law number to it, so you should have gotten it separately by email from Paul too. So it has no changes except for the three in front of the KP law number. Um, if you pull up the KP law opinion, because um, I just renumbered it for our, our purposes of agendas, um, so people could find it in the agenda. Um, so this is the one with KP laws comments that we have not received the last time we received comments on the bylaw. Um, and so, um, we're going to go through the comments, make any changes we need. Um, I'm going to try and I have to make it smaller so you can see the comments. So I apologize for that. The first one is, um, Jonathan wasn't sure he thought it, property type wasn't necessarily clear. So I believe my recommendation is to just add a parenthetical, um, And I'll put it in here that clarifies it. Um, a parenthetical like that. I'll fix the renumbering that just says that I think that's what we're going for. What what type of building is it? Type of property is it? What's it got on there? Um, Um, and then I think that addresses, oh, I have no idea why I got two comments. Um, I think that addresses uh, Jonathan's concern. Any other thoughts on his comment before we move to the next comment? Um, and if people have thoughts on, I, I know Pam, you might be working from a, f a former draft, but any comments you have on any part as we go through Jonathan's comments too, if I skip over something you have a comment on, take us back to it. Pam. Okay. Um, so this is num a letter C is exactly what prompted my question about, you know, are we capturing number of units, number of specifically number of bedrooms in our, in our, in the attributes that we're capturing for any given unit. And I just want to make sure that we're really clear that we, that we capture that. So that's D is the number of bedrooms in each dwelling unit. Yeah. yeah. As long, you know, I want the I want the I want the computer program to be able to uh, to handle it. And I, and the only reason I'm saying it is because I dealt with a computer program on the university for the 13 million square feet of space and each room was categorized. Each room has attributes. And I don't know if the town has anything near that capability such as that yep okay we're going to move on to jonathan's next comments they are basically the same thing they were, were um are about the response times that that we had wrote into the regulations that we found and had seen in other regulations actually um and other bylaws in other towns uh, Jonathan didn't like them, to, to summarize his comments. <laughs> um, How about our Jonathan? Um, yeah, our, our attorney said the court would probably strike them down if they were cited for something like this. John. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, this is critical because in the middle of the night, um, you know, if I call... Um, some of these big landlords, I'm just going to get an answering machine and leave a message. So it's up to me to figure out what to do with the tenants that can't stay there. So I think the question for us is, are we willing to keep it in and recognizing that if anyone challenges it, it may be struck down? Jennifer. 
so what would happen um you can't reach the landlord and you have to make a decision to like put the students up in a motel then do we tr the town tries to recoup that cost or or just you know, have a the last time it happened to me i got i was able to get in touch with um an on-call dean at umass these were umass students and they were able to house those kids for the night so I uh, just took a little more thinking, but it, it's, you know, it's happening at two o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. No, I mean that, yeah, I don't have a town credit card, you know, where I'm just going to put you right. up. Right. Yeah. No, I'm just, well, that's it. I would never have thought you could contact the Dean. So that's interesting to know, but yeah. And then if it was not a student, they would, it, it would be between them and the landlord to figure out what they had to do that night. I mean, in theory, with the students, it's between the student and the landlord, too, no matter the tenant, no matter their relationship. In theory, it's between the tenant and the landlord. It's just what makes our inspectors' jobs easier. <laughs> and are we willing to risk lawsuits and it being deemed? So, Pam. I'm, I'm comfortable leaving it in for now. And it's, it shows an urgency that, that someone reading this needs to be aware of. You know, we can we can always back off later, but I don't mind keeping the pressure on. Do others tend to agree? I'm seeing nods. So yeah. Melanie's, I think, okay with it, still thinking about it. I would have just gotten rid of it. I err on the side of not, but for now I'm I'm willing to leave it in. Um inspections. So this is one where I worked on trying to come up with language. Um, Jonathan, KP Law identified a conflict or a potential conflict between what we wrote in section A and section B, the two highlights here, um, and our bylaw. Um, so while, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I tried to come up with with the bylaw. Um, actually, I did it all in the bylaw, nothing in the regs. So um, there we go. In the bylaw, which we'll hopefully have time to get to later, I basically have some modifications or proposed modifications that indicate um, that the property will have passed an inspection. And then I add more within a frequency schedule identified in the regulations and sort of extra language like that within the time frame identified in the regulations. Um, so it doesn't, so I hope that it clarifies that it's not every year they have to pass the inspection. Essentially they have an inspection that is from a year and a half ago and that meets our frequently frequency schedule because it was a past inspection. Um, they don't need another one to get their permit. So I've, I've tried to massage that language. I've added some other language into the bylaw. I don't want to flip back and toggle back and forth now, but I think we can address it in the bylaw not without having to change the regs if the regs are the schedule we want, um, which I think the regs are. Pam. We, we have talked about the initial inspection. It is a critical one. I would guess that so many of the, so many of these units have been self-certified and, and are nowhere near what um, we think they should be. Um, I'm not sure we can, I'm not sure we can say B1A1, whether or not they have a prior permit, they need to undergo an inspection with, oh, within five years. I was thinking it was within half a year or something. Okay, so, okay. I have to go so within five years. Every... Continue, Pam, just, I'll be gone like 30 seconds, continue talking and Pam can run it oh. until I get there. Okay. I got a contract. Looking for an answer. I, I think I read it, I read it wrong. It, that within five years, everybody at least has an an initial inspection, and hopefully the the renewal inspection uh, within those five years. Am I? Yeah, I think it? it says you need the initial inspection within six months, and that's then I, yes, that's what I was getting confused by. Yeah, and then five years. Yep. Can we can we do them within six months? 
Um, if we need to do them all <laughs> the first time, no. Right. Yeah. So I think B1A1 is for when we flip to this new system. We're, we're back to the year implementation period, essentially. We're actually we're actually on B1A now because it did say six months. I thought I had seen six months in there. Yeah, no. Um, so I the the way I'm gonna take this one, that this or within the six months is um under the we have a provision for a contingent. I, I don't know whether it's called contingent permit um for when you fail an inspection. You can have a sort of, but I forget what it is in the bylaw. Let me look it up. Um, um, it's called a conditional permit. Um, yeah. And so I think we can la add language to the conditional permit or if you have an inspection scheduled. So for, for the six months thing here, what I was thinking was, I think what we were thinking when we wrote this was not the initial um, trans, the initial um, effectiveness into this new one. So the initial transition, but when someone wants their rental permit, do they need the inspection before they issue the rental permit or do they basically start with the application schedule the permit and can they while they've applied for the application while while they've got the application pending and are waiting that inspection which i don't know with our inspection departments once they ask for one will it take three months to get will it take one month to get can they have it within a week um they don't realize they're supposed to have a permit so the tenants have already moved in but they don't have an inspection. So that's what I was thinking of was with this in within six months. So I've added that to the temporarily to the conditional permit. If you've got an inspection scheduled, you can be issued your permit so your tenants can move in. We have to think about whether we want that, but that's that's what I was thinking this or within six months when you're first renting the property, right? If I were to change my house into a rental, um, I need it inspected, but you know what? I might not get it inspected before the new tenants come in for whatever reason, but I applied for the permit. Um, and maybe they couldn't inspect it before the tenant lease was starting, even though I applied for the permit. Can I get that conditional permit while the inspection is actually scheduled? Like I've done everything but had the inspection. So I, that's what I took this within six months of the initial first residential rental permit meant. And then this is the sort of transitional section. Jennifer. So, um, I mean, maybe a little what John's talking about now with the parents bringing kids back to school. What if the, if, should somebody be allowed to move into a unit? I mean, that isn't up to code or isn't safe. I mean, that's would just be my concern. You know, if they can move in and then they might not get inspected for six months and after the six months, they've been living in a dangerous situation. What's, is the, and in some sense, is the town liable for, say, for if something, God forbid, were to happen in those six months, you know, a fire, because an electrical system wasn't up to code, is that putting the town at risk that they've said, you know, we allow you know, tenants to move in, even though we may not ex inspect the property for a certain number of months or weeks. So that's a question, I guess, to John. <laughs> yeah, I'm not an attorney, but yeah. um, we have um, many uninspected properties that we let people live in right now. That we're letting them or they're doing it and we don't know that yeah, well, we don't know because we've never been in them. That I don't know that I don't okay. know that they have problems with them, but you know, and the one that I went in this week, it's not condemnable, um, but they just just self certify this at the beginning of the month, so you know, right. why am I able to find fifteen things wrong with it? It's not. It's not that somebody couldn't live there they could and it's not dangerous it's, but what um, if it was I, I so i'm just saying i apply for a permit 
You're very you're not, Right. So you're well, not supposed to have someone move in until you've at least applied for a permit, correct? Right. Well, I think that that's the conditional permit part. Yeah. That's correct. You've got a conditional permit. Now you're waiting for an inspection. When the inspection and happens, we'll- And certified to get the conditional permit. I don't know. Is that self-certification language still in? No, you have not self-certified to get the conditional permit. Right now, the conditional permit, uh, until we modify it based on, potentially based on KP Law's comments, right now a conditional permit can issue only if an inspection has failed. Um, mm -hmm. And they're working on fixing it. And we've said you can have that conditional permit so you're not in violation of the bylaw, right? You know. Our, our general bylaws are different than violations of state health code in a sense and what goes on that way. Our, our bylaw is you're not allowed to rent something unless you have a permit, right? right. Um, and yep. we're putting these conditions on it. So we're saying the conditional permit keeps you in compliance with the bylaw, even though you haven't met certain parts of the bylaw because we're in the process of fixing those parts that you haven't met. Seems Mainly reasonable right now and and so I've, i i'm going to propose language after reading kp law's comments here that adds not just failed inspections to the ability to issue a conditional permit but awaiting an inspection um because it just is scheduled but hasn't happened yet um so that's the applied a week before the person was moving in and you couldn't get the inspection in the week <laughs> you can still get your permit so you're not found in late or found in violation of the bylaw right and we and we all recognize that it could be four years later when you actually get your first permit no i mean you get your first inspection well uh, initially um for no this, this is after it's all happened so after this is all happened after we've we already been through all of these things and now somebody decides they want to rent their house um, yeah. they're going to come at a much slower rate. Okay. Okay. Got yeah. it. The transition is the five year timeline because we can't expect John on his own or his replacement on his own to get through how, how many units is this in one year? <laughs> so we're allowing for that five year transition, um, to make it happen, which I've, pro I've, tried to come up with language that would address that of Jonathan's too for the bylaw, but I put it all in the bylaw because um, he seemed to want it in the bylaw, not here. Any other comments, concerns before we move on? Let me know if I'm skipping anything. Um, Jonathan here said it might kind of conflict with this item up here. Um, that says just do it every five years. So he recommended language to fix that. Um, I kind of took his recommended language. Um, oh, wait, give me a second. Um, so I, Too many windows here. Um, so that's my proposed language that the code enforcement official has the discretion to select and inspect a sampling of dwelling units that ensures compliance with this section here, such that every dwelling unit is inspected at least every five years. That would allow John and Rob to instead of saying we're doing 25 every year in a 100 unit parcel or 20 every year in a 100 unit parcel or in this one 25 25 and so then they get in you get four years and then one year off they could say 20 every year or they could say we're going to do huffed in this year and hopefully not come back for five years um, and then we'll do another large building the next another large complex the next year would allow them to set their sort of big complex schedule. What do people yeah. think about that proposal? Is 
The next one is concern with inspection standards of who defines it, who does it, um, and whether we'll adopt one within the appendix because we don't have it yet. Um, um, oh, I did something somewhere else to try and address this concern. Um, That's what I did down here. So yeah, Jonathan was thinking, who who does the checklist and drafts it? And then he commented on the same thing down in four. So I thought we could just add to four that it's the principal code official that creates the checklists. And then we just say what it needs to include. Um, I think that addresses both of Jonathan KP Law's comments in 3A and 4A. What do people think? I have a question on historic houses where we, we are fully aware that many houses were renovated or became apartments um, under different building codes and um, a checklist, a, you know, I want to make sure things are, are not violating, you know, key health and safety codes, but is there any flexibility when you understand the age of the building? John? The sanitary code is, you know, just what you see in front of you. So it doesn't really matter when it was renovated. Um, it, when we we do look back at building permits on properties and that's what we were talking about doing research on properties and do they have any special permits and when did this thing happen? Um, we, we can find historical building permits for some of the stuff that happened, but a lot of things happen without anybody knowing about it, you know? Um, so that's just going to be that's going to be today's code applied to that. So question for something like electrical. Um, if my house was built in the knob and tube era and it hasn't undergone major renovation and still has knob and tube and now I want to rent it out. Will it pass this inspection that includes sections on electrical because it hasn't been renovated and it conformed with the electrical or by creating a checklist, are we sort of requiring an upgrade of these systems? Uh, good question. We might need to check with the electrical inspector on that, but um, in several properties that I've been in, when I've discovered active knob and tube, I've ordered it replaced. And that's you outside know, of rental I, bylaw at all. That's just you as an inspector, not whether I, they're renting the property or not. It's been in rentals. I mean, not in private homes. I, I have very little reason to get into a private home and look for that sort of thing. But, you know, the, the stuff that you find now, it's old enough that it's not um, difficult to find something wrong with it. Um, and so that's that's what triggers a need to to replace it. Hey, Jennifer, I have to digress, but yeah, we couldn't get insurance on our house till we replaced the knob and tube. So I don't know. Yeah, I think it's generally agreed it's not not agreed. really safe. Yes. <laughs> I just didn't know whether it gets grandfathered in if you haven't yeah. actually done stuff. Okay, moving on. His next one was with E here. Um, and and Jonathan, the uh, KP law said this, the state law would govern this schedule. Um, and they we'd need to, if we wanted to modify uh, or specifically do this outside of the state law schedule, we'd need state guidance. So I guess my thoughts are just delete it to make it easier on us. If it's already, if the, 
if the keeping of these is governed by some state law, let's just go with that. Can we state that then? I, I mean, because I think it's important if whether they're digital or paper, um, they're looking back, folks are looking back to see what was, you know, a violation three years ago. We want to make sure violations are noted. And to me, that's part of the record keeping. I don't know if you have to say a length of time, you could just say you'll keep them. How about that? That worked. Even Jonathan gave a, John gave a thumbs up for that one. Moving on. Um, life safety violations. He had the same comment in the, um, so B here, he had the same comment in the bylaw. I went back to our current draft and the prior draft and we deleted it in the current draft based on his comment. Um, and our discussion, I guess that would have been three weeks ago, maybe the last time we were here discussing the bylaw when we discussed KP Law's comments on the bylaw, we deleted this entire section from the penalty section and enforcement section of the bylaw. So it no longer sits in the bylaw draft. So I guess I recommend just deleting it. So he's saying, let me see if I understand his comment. Don't try to remove people from a property with something in the general bylaw. Use the other statutes that you Use already the state have. Statutes. Yeah. That's fine. That's great. Yep. <laughs> That's basically what he said. And I think when we went to the bylaw with this language, we agreed and said we'd remove it from the bylaw. So I think it makes sense to move it, remove it from the regs too. Committee agree for now? Um, Jonathan said all violation penalties and all should be in the bylaw, not in the, the these things. So I've I've got a draft of the bylaw that moves this to the bylaw, basically into a proper spot why, in the bylaw. Why is that? Does it give us more authority? Um, I, I think he just says, well, what does he say? Should be contained in the bylaw itself. I think that's just a standard state law thing, like just statutory construction and penalties. I, I assume he's just saying, put it there. So there's an easy place to put it. I've copied the language. I'll show it to you if we get time to get to the bylaw. Um, so I recommend deleting it here based on him, but not deleting that sentiment, getting that sentiment into the bylaw. Does that sound logical? If so, and I'll show you that language if we can get there today. If not, I'll show it to you next week. Um, so these, he did this twice, this comment twice. Um, I think what KP Law is saying, Jonathan's saying, is that this phrase he's not comfortable with. Is, is what I took from the comment. I don't know what other people are taking from this comment that, that says he cautions against using this type of criteria as a pretext to deny a rental permit. Um, we can, he said it's appropriate to review, to review in issuing it for compliance with other bylaws and zoning bylaws and all of that, but we shouldn't conduct a land use review under this bylaw. I think what I interpreted that as is we can't add additional land use requirements to this general bylaw. That's how I interpreted it. I, am? I, I don't feel like we are adding additional um, to, I think we are, we're saying, any management plan, whether it's ZBA, whether it's SPR, whatever, every single permit um, is often in consultation with fire, 
police just in terms of can I get my, you know, can, can I get a fire truck around this building? Can I get access to the front door? Whatever it is, I don't feel like we're adding requirements. We're just saying we will consult to make sure that the management plan actually works. So the management plan will have nothing to do with circulation of access. Yes, the management yes, it will. Yes, it will. A, a parking, the parking plan may have parked cars so close to the building that, that one wouldn't be able to pull another vehicle up oh, close to whatever. This one would, and that's part of our basic management plan. But if we if someone already has a management plan here and it doesn't include for some reason, and I'm not sure why our zoning ZBA or planning board wouldn't have ensured this. I think what Jonathan's saying is you can't add that requirement onto this if they've already got one here, if we're saying this is sufficient. Well, it's sufficient if they already have a permit, if they already have a, a special permit, um, it has gone through that review. So the, in fact, they, you know, are that section review uh is twice it, it follows the parking one and it follows yeah this and one. he made the comment in both yeah <laughs> well i hadn't seen his but um yeah parking management i think of is different than parking site plan i don't know why in in either case in either case, if we could say something like, um, in terms of scroll back up a little bit where it goes under A. So the A and B are two different situations. One is you already have a permit. You've already been reviewed. Um, um, I, if we if we said including the following with with confirmation by um other other town entities such as fire and fire and police a basic management plan blah 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 i'm guessing then maybe tom tell me if we're wrong does anyone in fire or police actually review management plans anybody besides you or rob um That's a good question. Because these man, are we talking about um, something that's a management plan that is happening through uh, the special permit process? Or, I mean, it's, we're not we're not getting routinely management plans, you know, with a rental permit. So the regulations here are requiring that a, with the rental permit that the property submit a management plan. The, the bylaw requires that for the, the new yeah. bylaw requires a management plan be submitted and okay. they can either submit one of, they have two options to submit a management plan that was approved under their land use permit. So if they, yep, they already have one, they yeah. already have one, they submit that and presumably that's sufficient. I think what Jonathan Murray is saying is that needs to be sufficient. If sure. it's already been accepted, we can't add management right. plan requirements on. Um, and, and if they don't have one, we're asking a basic management plan that includes these six items. So they can choose to submit one or the other. Yeah, um, uh, this doesn't look onerous to me. Um, but then he flagged this part that really talked about sufficiency of circular and vehicular access. He didn't flag what this was, which is interesting. As Pam talks, it gets me thinking about like, what is he actually flagging, right? Um, and so I don't, all it says is that we're gonna consult with someone from fire that. Right. So what if instead of saying that language there, cause I think, I, I feel like that's what he took issue with that specific language. If we add, after principal code official
others is a bad word, but we add that consultation that Pam was talking about. I don't want to restrict it too much. Um, so like department heads worries me, or we could just say public safety officials as necessary or something. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And then we could delete this. Right up to there, that's good, okay. But we've added the consultation in, but not put in exactly what they're consulting for, which I think it was that exact phrasing that Jonathan Murray was concerned about. Does that work, Pam? Yeah, that works for me. Okay. And so he flagged it here too. So we'll do the same thing. Does that work? If so, we're going to move on. He wanted this updated. That's the bylaw we're dealing with, so I'm not sure why it would need updated. But I guess if the number changes, he would want it updated. Um, but otherwise, the only last comment he had was about the 60 day that we wrote in. Um, he thought maybe we don't want to put a limit in. So I guess my comment is thoughts about deleting the limit. Did the board have any um, comment on this? Um, they have not. They have been sent. Um, I don't know whether they've had, they might be meeting right now. Um, <laughs> They, uh, I have sent the chair both sets of KP law comments for them before before the KP law comments. They didn't have any problem with these. We might have even extended this from 45 to 60. The first draft might have had 45 in it. I'm not sure. Um, but, I can't believe you don't by law have to have a limit. That surprises me. Yeah. And that the attorneys recommending don't put one in. <laughs> I mean, if I if I were an owner and I wanted action and I was appealing something, I would want a time frame. Yeah. So the hearing ha the hearing has to be held within thirty days, which helps for a time frame, right? And they're saying, you know, so another month, and we would like your decision with another within another month. I don't think it's it doesn't feel onerous. Yeah, I mean, I guess the attorney's just saying, I, it was certainly for the person making the appeal, it's fair to have a time frame. I guess he's saying just, if you don't it, legally have to do it, it, I'm surprised. Yeah, I think he's saying you don't legally have to do it, so don't do it, because if you do put it in and they don't meet it, the appeal is, is granted automatically, right? And it's, so- It's, it's a constructive grant, timeline, that's right. right. You're adding in a potential way that, causes an automatic grant of the appeal if something happens with the timing. Is that the, is that also with the 30 days from date of filing? Yeah. So I the board was fine with this 30 days. They meet monthly. Um, so they didn't have a problem with that. And I think they supported that. They, 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 they were fine, I believe, with both of them. And like I said, I think they they moved that to at least 60 from the last time I talked to I them. This would they be if they couldn't get a quorum, that would be, yeah. Yeah. If it's in the middle of summer and they can't get a quorum, they're going to have a problem here. Or they get a quorum for the meeting, but they really have questions, right? Here's the thing. They hold their first hearing within 30 days, but they're not done. So but it gives you, it to, get, you, there's a way to extend that with a written agreement. That's how we do it on the ZBA that I serve on. We just all agree that we're going to, we yeah. agree to an extension. If you get a property person, I mean, these, these appeals are for expen suspensions and failure to issue. So you've got no rent in potentially during that time. Um, 
So does think, that last, sorry, does that yeah. last sentence required time limits may be extended by written agreement? That goes to what John just said. Um, does that does that add the flexibility needed? Only if you've got cooperative parties. <laughs> that's right. Oh, that's true. <laughs> so, I'd say don't put it in then. I mean, if the attorney says it's not required. Can we say, can we say she'll be made promptly? So I was of, thinking like a, in a timely manner. I don't, I don't know if you want to hem yourself yeah, I don't in. Yeah, you want to go there, right. If we put something in, and, and I would just delete it. The attorney says it's not necessary. I, okay. I'd give the town flexibility. So but if too. we wanted okay. to put something in, instead of from the date of filing of the appeal, I would stay from the date of the close of the hearing. Yeah, that's better because you've already burned 30 days. Um, yeah, potentially. Yeah, I would agree with that. So, you know, if we're going to keep a date in, I'd change it from, I'd change it to from the date of the close of the hearing. So which do people want? Nothing or date of close of hearing? Close of hearing. I'm good with that. I could go either way, but it's definitely better than filing. We'll keep it like that and we can think about it next time. That's the that, Is that actually a public hearing? Is it called that? Yep. Okay. Close yep. of hearing is good because you can just continue the hearing without closing it. So, right. you know, it can go on for quite some time. Yeah. Right. And if you've closed it, you really should make your decision. So, <laughs> and not sit on it. Okay, so these are the regulations. Um, I will come in with a cleaner copy of this, having gone through it next time. Um, and then let me pull up, I'm gonna pull up the bylaw that has my changes in it, um, or my recommendations that we talked about so that people can see it. Um, I just have to find it. And I don't think this will take too long, but if it does, we're gonna move on to public comment right after this. Um, but so we talked about a couple of things, I think, let me start at the top to make sure. Um, So the changes I was discussing um, are in, part of it is in red here, um, is that conditional, a perm the conditional permit can be issued if um, an inspection it, for a property that does not pass the initial renewal inspection or has or a property that has been scheduled for an initial or renewal inspection that has not yet occurred. So that's the, you applied for it, you thought you could get your inspection within a day and because you know people apply late and they didn't, the conditional permit can be issued instead. That required, I thought of adding some language because the, the conditional permit is supposed to specify a time frame um, and for deficiencies, but if it hasn't happened yet, there are no deficiencies. So I tried to add language that does that. So I think that takes care of one of two of Jonathan Murray's concerns regarding that inspection frequency, if people are okay with that language. Um, and then the other one was down here, in the requirements to obtain the permit, the inspections. This is the best language I could come up with for now um, in thinking about addressing his concerns. Um, so instead of reading the residential rental, rental property shall pass an inspection um, before a permit is issued or renewed, I reworded it to shall have passed an inspection um, in accordance with the applicable frequently, frequency schedule in the regulations adopted under this bylaw before a permit is issued or renewed. So I think that might take care of it. I, I obviously don't know, but I think that's a little more clear that adding that have in there is not sort of an active pass immediately before, but it could be years before. 
And then I added the next sentence that says what the regulation shall set forth in the frequency. So the frequency of the required inspections, the number of units to be inspected and provisions for phasing in this inspection requirement upon adoption of the bylaw. That was the third thing Jonathan flagged was that. So I thought if we put that in there, that we're specifically saying you go to the regulations to find out that phasing. Does that seem like it addresses his concerns? I don't know whether he'd be okay with it, obviously, <laughs> but it's it's an attempt to deal with his concerns. And does he get this again to look at? Um, probably after we finalize and make a recommendation, maybe, right? Because it will have never gone to GOL. And so right. in theory, if we're making the recommendation to the council, the council will forward it on to GOL before it votes on adoption um, for final legal review of the two. Um, I know you can't read that. There was one other thing. Oh, the penalty section. This is the one where I said, I found a place to put that penalties where Jonathan Murray was saying it doesn't belong in the regulations. Um, we had a monetary penalty section that says they can be imposed. And if there's a timely correction of violations, the principal code official may reduce or eliminate the penalties. And so I figured we'd add the if they're not made within the time limit, they can be retroactively applied to the date that the received the complaint inspection form. So I think that's probably, this is where I would want John to say, should it say receive the notice of violation, identifying the existent, the existing violations, or just received the notice of violation? If repairs are not made within the designated time limit on a notice of violation, the monetary penalty may be retroactively applied. It would go back to the date of the violation. Yeah. Whatever, whenever that notice was dated. So that's the move from the, the other move from the regulations into the bylaw. Anything else for now? Pam. Um, I wanna hear from the folks listening and then I oh. just have some general comments about the structure because I think some of our little category sections are out of order. Okay, can you do the, so you have structure comments. Can you do them quickly? Uh, yeah, I could just, I can tell you exactly what I'm, Talking yeah, about. just, just so say have, what you're doing and then we can figure out what we'll do with it later, but. Fine, fine. We're trying to do, you know, our purpose is to make a clear application process. So we have purpose, definitions, um, um, state law not preempted, residential permit required, and then we have exemptions, and then we have issuance or denial. And I would I would suggest we consider talking about the application itself before we talk about issuing it or denying it. So I would simply put section F in front of section, I mean, section G in front of X, section F. From a logical standpoint, I'm trying to think, you know, we're, we're right. saying we've got a clear process. And that's the, the only section you're thinking needs yeah. moved? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we wanted this reinspection fee potentially changed. I'll look for it in other places. Um, okay. So the goal is. I will get these modified clean versions out to everyone into next week's packet um, tomorrow. Next week, if we can get to a vote on a recommendation, I would be thrilled. <laughs> so that means the job is 
if you haven't read them closely and you want to read them closely or you've got any other questions to add or things to add, you got to come prepared next week with what you're doing and what you're suggesting. Pam. Okay, I, I want to hear from things that people yes. in the audience, but I have one more. I have a couple of issues in terms uh -huh. of our definitions category. So I don't want to do it now. I want to wait until folks have talked. Yeah. Okay, so we will move to public comment. Um, public comment on matters within the jurisdiction of CRC at this time. For up to three minutes, you can make a public comment. Um, so if you would like to make a public comment at this time, please raise your hand. Public comment is open. Um, and you do it by pressing the raised hand button. So bear with me, Renata Shepard, you should be able to unmute yourself and make your comment. Please state your name. Um, where you live, and then make your comment. Hi, Renata Shepard, um, Justice Drive in Amherst, and um, there's a lot of things to consider. Um, I am curious to see the final proposed bylaw, and I'm hoping that even with the final proposed bylaw, because there's so many things to consider, that we can still make some changes if need be or if legally necessary or uh, public input. Um, and I'm still hoping that the uh, fees for inspections and permits uh, are still reasonable and fair, um, hopefully under a hundred dollars. But um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see what the final product is and again, hoping that it can still be adjusted because it still seems to be very much in progress, in process. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your comment, Renata. Seeing no other hands, we are going to close the general public comment period. Um, we have two minutes until we're adjourning this meeting. So Pam, do you want me to put the bylaw back on? Is it the bylaw you've got for no, the regs? You don't need okay. that. I'm, I'm, I'm talking generally about um, two definitions. And one is owner-occupied. We have, we have our owner-occupied um, in, what is it, 12.36 or something in our own yes. bylaws. Um, it has been brought to my attention that, in fact, um, a number of people live in town who have already put their homes into trust for um, Medicare clawback protection, and that they, in fact, are still living there. So in, in principle, they are still the owner -occup occupants, but they're, um, by, by our definition, they don't qualify as their own owner-occupied people. So that's one thing, and I think we need to give some consideration. There's some folks out there thinking about it, and maybe they'll come up with something. The secondly, secondly is a recent court case in Worcester in which um, the, the case was made that people, four or more people renting rooms um, in a in a in a in a dwelling are considered lodgers and so a lodging a lodging house um which is defined in state law as a house where lodging lodgings are let to four or more persons not within the second degree of kindred to the person conducting the the, the business such a facility is called a lot a lodging house and we have that condition in Amherst. So I think we need to um, we need to close that loophole. If we want to allow four people in a house, then we have to make sure it still complies with state law. Can you send the committee out? The yeah. case you're referring to, so so we can see it, and and, and maybe include John and Rob on it, <laughs> and yeah. and Dave 
still next yeah. so, so Dave can can see it too just so we can be ready for next week on because I believe we exempted lodging facilities from this permit system um and so and, we need and, to approve and, all of that, that we describe lodging as six units six units but not more than 10 as a lodging and the state in this in this case is saying anything four or more is considered lodging. So um, we, we don't wanna be contrary to state law. Yeah. So ju just send that out to Dave, John, Rob, and the committee. Um, and I'll make sure it gets in the packet too. If you send it in a form that I can print it, we'll put yep. it in the packet for anyone else who's interested in that. Um, but yeah, so those are two other things. I've made note on those definitions um, of those issues um, so that people are reminded of them as they're going through it for next week. Obviously my goal is to get through and maybe vote on a recommendation next week so that it's out of our hands and to someone else's hands at least. I mean, it might come back to our hands, <laughs> you never know, but it would be great for it to be at the council for discussions at the council. Um, at some point. Um, the earliest would be August 7th at the council, but my guess is I'm not sure Lynn would put it on the 7th. I think she'd probably put it on whatever the next August meeting is, the 21st. Um, but I don't know. So, um, okay, with that, I don't have oh, Jennifer, sorry, your hand is up. Yeah, no, no, this is just if we're doing definitions. I just had a Maybe I should wait till next week because I want to discuss it now. It's after minute after six. But um, with owner occupancy in a town with you know a lot of academics who may go on sabbatical, is if someone's gone for years that's still owner occupied, that's something we have. That question was asked. We can get to that next week. Yeah. So so we can get to that. We did exempt sort of that short term one time one year rental from even this permit system um, for a rental during a sabbatical year. But if they continue that year as to a second year, they have to apply for a permit. So we can we can look at that issue, though. Um, and all so. Um, I'll, I'll find a way to make a note of that um, with that. I don't have announcements. I don't next agenda is already posted because of vacation things. I don't think I'm going to modify it. Um, at signing on. Just she said she'd come on at six, maybe six. not realizing we were adjourning she at six. She started at four. Pat, welcome, Pat. You're here right before the announcement. I'm so sorry. I was in a mobile no. meeting and I you're, totally- You're totally fine. We're about ready to adjourn though. So. Mandy, <laughs> can I ask a question? Sure, John. The next meeting, is it at 4 o'clock or 4.30? It is at 4.30 on July 20th, next Thursday. This one was moved because Shalini heads to TSO for 7, I think. So we wanted to give Shalini some time. Um, so For dinner. <laughs> yeah, so the next- I will agenda, watch the meeting. The next agenda is rental registration. I have other things on the agenda in case we finish rental permitting early, um, but we won't get to those other things unless we finish the rental permitting. We may be able to, depending on- continuing comments. Um, that's the next agenda I will be posting after that, the agendas for the August meetings shortly thereafter. Um, I'm waiting to see whether we actually get through rental permitting, because if we do, I don't want to put it on the next agendas <laughs> um, unnecessarily. Um, so that's it. Is there anything not anticipated that we need to talk about? Not that. Welcome, Pat, and goodbye, everyone. We are adjourned at 6.04. You're the okay. best meeting ever, Pat. <laughs> Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.